Hello, drummers and other creatures. I really shouldn't be wearing this shirt to film. I just realised that I've psyched myself up for this now and I have to <laughs> have to get going. So pardon me, whatever. Pardon me, the International Film Guild of people who know what to do with video camera, whatever it is. Anyway, in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the fabulous Richie Hayward's drumming on Dixie Chicken by the fabulous Little Feet. Possibly the greatest band that ever existed. Give or take the Blockheads, maybe, I don't know, E Street Band. There are a few good bands, but Little Feet's way up there anyway. And they don't get enough credit. Um, Lowell George, fabulous singer. Oh, I love, love, love Little Feet. So I was quite delighted when somebody asked me to uh, cover like what's going on in Dixie Chicken. Um, but then it sort of led me down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to figure out what the hell's going on there. So um, I'm, I'm, it's one of those things that it took me a lot of thinking to realise there's not that much to it. But it's going to take you a lifetime to get any good at it, if that makes any sense. Because it's just Richie Hayward and the man had a certain magical something. I don't know. Um, all right, so now let's take a, a, a look at what's going on. Um, I'm going to be thinking more about the uh, live versions of Dixie Chicken. And it's, it's a shame, you know, in this internet age, I kind of take it for granted that if, if I do a bit of detective work or a bit of searching around the internet, YouTube in particular, you can find, I don't know, sort of insights into stuff. And there's just not enough stuff relating to, to Richie Hayward due to what, whatever reasons. There's not enough footage. Um, you know, maybe Little Feet wasn't big enough to have had, um, you know, quite enough footage. There's not enough clips of Richie Hayward playing. There's a few, there's some clues to what he's doing. But let's dig into this. I'm, I'm going to talk about what I, I consider the main grooves as, as far as I can hear them with my poorly ears uh, in the song. And, um, as I say, the, the sort of live version, so I'm listening to uh, Waiting for Columbus, there's the famous sort of electric, electric, electric lycanthrope recording, which was a, a sort of live show. And, you know, Waiting for Columbus was like a big live album, and it's quite possible that there was some monkeying around with it. I think a lot of the famous live albums had a lot of extra studio input, shall we say, to the production. But something like electric lycanthrope, it's probably a live and unadulterated performance. And I've been looking at whatever live clips I can find and trying to catch those few seconds of Richie Hayward where we can see him playing the drums to try and discern what's going on because it's, it's really bloody difficult to hear what he's playing because you've got the whole band there and, I don't know, live recordings aren't always as, as crispy and clear, especially not in the olden days as the studio recordings. In the studio recording, he's playing something more basic than I'm going to describe him doing in the live performances. So um, that's why I'm kind of skipping that, because if you can play what I'm going to show you, then you can sort of roll it back a little bit um, just to play like the studio version. And anyway, let, let's get stuck in. The main thing that he's doing uh, is he's playing a two-handed halftime shuffle even though I don't really like calling it half-time shuffle, I don't really think it's, it's half-time. I, I, I would say it's a 16th note shuffle, but you know we, we need to conform to the mass. So on a mass level, it's called a half-time shuffle. Uh, to me, it's a 16th note shuffle, but we'll, we'll look at it from both perspectives and you can decide you know, which way you want to look at it. Um, I'm gonna play just the hi-hat version, um, but it's a double-handed, Shuffle, so it's a bit like the Texas Shuffle. I've got some videos about the Texas Shuffle, the Pride and Joy Stevie Ray thing uh, played by Chris Layton. But this time we're going to do it half time. So if we're counting it as eighth notes, we're going to go one and two and three is where the snare is. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Or counting it as sixteenths, one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Okay, we're going to do this. That's the halftime shuffle. Now, I've practiced playing this 
and it's quite tricky <laughs> to get it to sound good, right? Because first of all, we need to coordinate our hands really well. We don't want any flamming when we're playing this. Then uh, the way Richie Hayward's playing, according to my ears and the, the little bit that I've seen, he's accenting the, the one and two and three and four, or one e and uh, the, the numbers in the ands, if I'm counting sixteens. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. So we've got a sort of push pull down up motion. Now, th there's discussion about how much shuffliness is going into the, the feel of something like this. And um, it, again, it's one of those things that you might call a sort of in the cracks feel possibly, but possibly not. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that as we go forward. So make sure you keep watching. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, so we've got that accented one and two and three and four and or one e and a two e and a. And I'm just playing a bog standard triplety shuffle. On the snare side, I'm going to be accenting one e and a two e and a three e and a four. So I'm going to be playing half as many accents. If I'm counting an eight note, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So putting that together, I'm just going to focus on the hands. Now, it's really useful, the softer you can play the, uh, the shuffly notes apart from, you know, the non-accented notes with your snare hand. In the clips where I saw Richie Hayward playing this, he actually looks quite active with it. So I don't think he's, you know, playing ghosty ghost notes there, but he's in a big stadium problem. Well, I don't know, not a stadium, but in a pretty big venue, I would have thought the band is very, very loud and he's probably got some leeway to kind of chunter away with those uh, snare drum notes. Um, if you're going to be playing this in your local pub or whatever, or a smaller setting, if you're rehearsing this with the band, I'd be really, really careful to play those notes as softly as possible. And you might even decide not to play that in a, a sort of gig situation because it might just eat up too much of the sonic space and drive your band mad. So practice playing this groove, but I would guess, you know, go with an open mind if you're going to play this with your, uh, with your local band. Um, ask your bandmates what they think about it, even the guitarist. Even ask the guitarist what he thinks. Or definitely ask the singer, is that too much? And then maybe let go of playing those uh, softer snare drum notes and maybe just do this. You could sort of, you could do a purdy shuffle. Um, I played a purdy shuffle, um, you know, with the in between e triplets one e and a, a one and a two and a three and a, you know, the purdy shuffle. I don't need to tell you what that is. Um, but if you want to know, I did make a video about it as, as well as every other drummer on the internet. But you could play a purdy shuffle. It doesn't feel quite right to me for some reason, but if it feels good to you when you're doing that, that's fine. Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit. Let's get back to this two handed shuffle a half-time texas shuffle no that doesn't sound right it's, it's sort of louisiana swamp music isn't it now all we're doing with the bass drum is um one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a eight. Ooh, it feels
feels very naked doing that. Okay. So you would work on that. Even if you don't want to play Dixie Chicken, it's a great exercise to do to coordinate both of your hands. Try and play as smooth as you can without flamming. And you've got like, you know, you've got the layer of different accent patterns happening between one hand and the other. So have a play of that. Now, to add a little extra sizzle, you can put some open hi-hat in there. I think that, you know, when you get used to playing this pattern, maybe you can just sort of experiment and see what your left foot, or whichever foot it is you're using on the hi-hat, see what that foot wants to do. There are some, uh, you know, patterns that seem obvious. feels like it wants to be on the E's and R's. Again, experiment for yourself, that's more fun that way. Okie dokie. Now, in the verses and the choruses, we can play the hi-hat, that's cool. Do you want to maybe relax your foot a tiny bit on the hi-hat in the chorus to just open up a bit, maybe? See how it feels. When we get into the um, sort of riff bit, do 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 that bit after the chorus, um, then we're going over to the ride, and there are three different patterns I'm hearing on the ride. The first one is just the regular shuffle thing. And again, there's a, there's a bit of an accent, I would say, on the uh, one, e, and, or the one, and, two, and, three, and in sixteenths. That's in there. I think quite commonly there's also an accent on the ands. In sixteenths, anyway, one e ana, two e ana, three e ana. If you're counting in eights, one and two and three, so it'd be the two and four. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. And then finally, I also hear him accenting. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. So the uh, the numbers in the ands, if you're counting eights, or the one e and uh, the number uh, no the numbers of the ands, if you're counting sixteenths, or the one and two, or all the numbers if you're counting eights, right? So it's uh, ah, let me just play it for you. So. This one, okay? So it sounds like this. We can keep the bass the same. Oh! The body, the body keeps the score. We're also playing the uh, the hi hat on all the downbeats. One, two, three, four. So one, one and two and three and four in eights, but in sixteenths. Was that a good idea to introduce the idea of being able to count it as eights and sixteenths? Maybe that's giving you more of a headache. But I, I'll write this out. I will post a PDF for you to look at so you don't have to completely internalize everything from my verbal explanation such as it is. But okay, if we're counting in eights, we're gonna be playing one and two and three, four. We're gonna play the numbers, right? One and two and three and four on the hi-hat with the foot. If you're counting in sixteenths, it's gonna be one e an a two, the numbers in the ands, one e an a two, e an a three, a four, e an. Okay? Now this might be a little bit challenging to do. If you've not done this kind of hi-hat footwork before, I would just start off playing, ignoring your bass drum foot, play a regular, just shuffle on the bow of the ride without any accents, play the snare drum pattern, and then try and introduce that hi-hat. Once you play that, play that. Don't, I brought the bass drum in a bit prematurely, but um, play it, play that just with the hands and try and get your hi hat foot used to it, and then gently introduce the bass drum. 
And you may want to do that really, really slowly. And there's, there's anything you find challenging, just do it really, really slowly and it'll come to you. Okay, so let's get that going again. And this time I'm going to add the accents that are played on the ride bell like this. Okay, so for my mind, that covers the main groove requirements for you to play Dixie Chicken. Now, how much time have I got? I have a bit of time left. Let's have a look at the, the degree of shuffliness here. Uh, uh, this is something I've been sort of breaking my head over, trying to work out. And uh, I've seen discussions about, you know, Richie Hayward being a bit of a sloppy, loosey-goosey drummer about the band having a certain loose feel. And I, d I don't know if I would describe the feel as looseness. I think they're, <laughs> they're really, really tight, actually, and they, they know what they're doing. I sort of associate loose as being, you know, somewhat inadequately accurate. But I don't think that's, that's, the, um, that's the, the correct explanation for how their, their music feels. And in this song in particular, and it's, sort of seems more obvious to me in the album version of the song, but in, in all the various renditions I've listened to, it does feel like there's a sort of change in the degree of shuffliness going, especially from the, the like verse into what I would sort of think of the, the bridge bit and then into the chorus. But I'm fairly convinced, and it, it's really difficult to hear because the only way to really tell if, for example, it's, it's the drum, it's Richie Hayward changing the feel here is if you can really hear the hi-hat clearly, because otherwise you can be a little bit loose with your subdivision, you know, shuffliness, and I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, for me anyway, to put my finger on it. So I'd love to hear any comments if you've watched this far into the video about, you know, where you think this sort of greasy, in the cracks feel is. For nine million listens to the song, um, I think it's that the, the bass, the bass guitar, is sort of changes, changes feel in the, uh, in the bridges. Uh, she took me to the river where she cast a spell. Bum -ba -dee -bum -ba -dum. It, that kind of straightens out. I think it's the bass. I don't think the drums are really changing. So I think you've got a thing where the bass is kind of rubbing up against the, um, you know, it's going into a straight sort of 16th and rubbing up against the triplety feel of the drumming. Um, again, we're in the eighth note perspective there, right? Or, you know. But anyway, the feel of the bass guitar is straightening out. With that said, let's see if we can look at a way to sort of explore degrees of shuffliness. And if you think about it, we've got, uh, I've put my sticks down for a minute and, and I hope I can sort of make this reasonably coherent at the end of the video. But, We've got straight, one and two and three and four and. And then we've got a triplety shuffle, one and a two and a three and a four and a. And then we've got a sort of 16th -y, dotted eighth, 16th shuffle, one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. And so you've got straight at this end of the spectrum and then a sort of 16th note feel or eighth note dotted eighth, 16th feel at that end. And in the middle, oh, I wish I had three limbs there, no. Um, we've got the triplets in the middle, right? Straight, triplety shuffle, dotted eighth, sixteenth shuffle. Now, the feel of the in the crack thing is somewhere between straight and the triplety shuffle. So what's a good idea is to kind of try and explore um, that space and learn how to play in it, right? By learning to morph or move your, your feel 
on the go in real time from, let's say in this case, you can practice this until the, the 16th, but in this case, we'll just go between straight eighths and triplets. And we're gonna try and sort of smoothly transition from that to that and just see how the shuffle uh, emerges from straight really and all it is is moving if, if we're counting one and two and three and four it's moving the and closer to the number that follows it so I would be moving the and of one closer to the two right so again I'll try and clap this out so if I've got one and two and three and four and by turning it into a triplety shuffle I'm moving the and closer to the uh, the number that follows one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four okay hope that makes sense so I'm going to try that on the uh, hi-hat I hope that sounded any good. Now I could get back into my sort of double-handed shuffle thing. Maybe I, I won't be too concerned about playing any accents on the snare, but we can just do that as a two-hand exercise. Um, have a go doing that and then you know if, if you've got the hang of the the actual pattern that half time or 16th note shuffle whatever you want to call it uh, that I showed you earlier on this brilliant video um, you can try and experiment with that going from straight to a triplety shuffle feel little bit challenging and I wouldn't recommend again in a sort of real situation where you're playing this with your mates down the pub trying to mess around with degree of shuffliness unless you've you know sort of arranged that with the other people you're playing with don't I wouldn't single-handedly try and do that but but maybe if you find a nice kind of greasy feeling shuffle somewhere between the straight eights and the triplety shuffle that feels good to you and that kind of clicks with what your other bandmates are doing, go ahead and, and have a go with that. So I think that's the essence of that. Let me know what you think. Have I managed to represent something about Richie Hayward and given him the respect he's due? Go away, have a go and have a go at playing this, see how you get it to feel. And, uh, you know, let me know what you think in the comments. That's the important thing, because at the moment, my most popular video is the one where I've pissed everybody off. And it's not really, well, <laughs> something I find quite easy to do, but it's not really what I want my channel to be about. So if you can do me a favor and comment on some of my more you know, helpful videos, um, you know, get some engagement going, that would be much appreciated. Meantime, I think it's time for you to go off and practice. <laughs>